All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to speak to you today because we're, this is essentially the culmination of about uh, 12 to 18 work, uh, months of work across three or four different work streams in the Are We've Core team. And we saw that this event was coming together in Asia and we were all gathering and we thought, well, what better time to launch all of this than when we're all in one place in, in physical space. So thank you again to the Ever Finance team for putting this all together. And yeah, I, I can't wait to talk to you about it. So uh, I think the core theme of all of this is that in the Arweave ecosystem, decentralization is not just a buzzword. This is not just something we say, yeah, 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 it's decentralized. You know, that's how we raise money. That's how, no. We need the protocol to be fundamentally decentralized so that it can achieve the things it wants to achieve. We need to create neutrality of the protocol. Why is that? Well, Arweave is fundamentally a ledger of speech and assertions. It is a permissionless system that lets anyone speak uh, over long periods of time. It's kind of like a new paper, except unlike paper, it doesn't just forget. It doesn't get uh, destroyed. It doesn't disappear. It uh, replicates people's ideas and thoughts essentially indefinitely. 200 years is extremely low end for what it's worth. You pay for 200 years when you put data into Arweave, and then as the cost of storage declines, that 200 years goes up. It doesn't go up by a little bit. It tends to go up by like, yeah, at one point last year, we were at 1,000 years worth of data storage costs in the endowment at one point in time. So it goes up a lot. Um, OK, so in order to gain a decentralized ecosystem, there are a number of things we need to do. The funny thing about a protocol, right, is that it always starts from like, in this case, I had the idea, and then I spoke to a few people, and then we started building it, and then it grew, and then it grew, and it grew, and here we are today. Um, but over that process, there needs to be a, a sort of continual decentralization of not just the technical infrastructure, but also the social infrastructure. So today, we're announcing three new initiatives from the, um, the I guess, founding team of the Arweave Protocol to further push decentralization. Uh, the first is Arweave 2.6. This took us, I think, 18 months of research and development. Um, it's a really major protocol upgrade. We thought about calling it Arweave 3.0, but we eventually decided not to, but it's more or less a big enough upgrade. Um, so what does it do? Well, it's all about more data, less energy. Uh, so the basic principle of this is that we are making the protocol much more efficient at how it enforces that miners store data and they waste less energy in the meantime. What does this mean in practice? Well, if we were to look at the network today, which is running Arweave 2.5, uh, we're buying essentially 430 replicas of every piece of data in the network as it currently stands. When Arweave 2.6 is out, we will be buying 9,900 replicas of the data, which probably makes it the most replicated data set in the world. And it's democratized. Anyone can put their data into that data set for, you know, half a cent to a cent per megabyte. So it makes the archive much, much more efficient and more effective at achieving its mission. And over the long term, that also means that we can procure uh, storage at a cheaper price from miners. So this fundamentally gives us proof of work style security with proof of stake style efficiency. So we, we all saw that the Ethereum merge happened recently. That's great for reducing the amount of energy that they were burning. I think it was 1% of the planet's energy, which is pretty significant. But it you, you does come with trade-offs, things like long-range attacks. So if you ever have a, a certain majority of um, voting power in the network, you can retrospectively write a new chain of su sufficient length that claims an entirely different history. This is, like, not great. There's a lot of problems with this in, in proof of uh, stake. So we've always loved this idea of useful proof of work in the Arweave community. What if we put that um, security budget, essentially, of the network to doing something useful? In our case, making hundreds or thousands of replicas of the data set. Well, we just made that much, much, much more efficient. So how does it work? Um, it's a, uh, a hash chain that we use to enforce what is essentially a limiter. Surprising thing about protocol design, sometimes adding a limit actually makes things go more efficiently. And the idea here is we say, OK, uh, it doesn't matter how much CPU power you have in the world. It doesn't matter how fast you can access the data. You can only uh, perform challenges in the network 
at a speed of 200 megabytes per second per replica of the data set. What this means in practice is that you can't break that limit, and so you're incentivized as a miner to just make more replicas of the data, which is better for us, of course, because that fills more hard drives in the world with more copies of the data set, increasing longevity. Um, another really cool thing that this does is, is surprisingly tangential, but, but it, it solves a fundamental problem in decentralized data storage, which um, <laughs> those of you that have used IPFS might have come across. And, and it's not just IPFS for what it's worth, it's actually all distributed data storage systems have this fundamental issue. So in computer science, if you want to build a system that's gonna get from your piece of data, sorry, from an address, uh, uh, like identifier, to a piece of data that you want, the first thing you do is you organize the data set, right? Like, you, you have a haystack, you say, <laughs> throw that out, pre-process the haystack, organize it into a nice, efficient set of piles, and then you can find your way to the data very efficiently. Problem is, in a decentralized network, you can't do that, because data comes and goes, nodes come and go. Uh, it's very, very, very tricky to, uh, well, you just get no data processing, basically. And what this means in practice is the best you can do is uh, Kademlia. Kademlia is an algorithm from 1998 or 1999, I forget, um, uh, or 97. <laughs> First proposed by the Nutella uh, uh, protocol. I'm not sure if anyone's getting some nods. Yeah, it was a super early file sharing system. It basically said, what if we can share files peer to peer, like long before Napster? And basically, the state of the art hasn't improved since then. That is also what uh, IPFS runs, it's what GUN runs, it's, it's basically everywhere in the ecosystem. Well, when we were building this new mining algorithm for Arweave, we realized that if we um, make it so that every miner is incentivized to work together in groups to make full replicas of the data set, we can make finding data super efficient. So from the miner's point of view, this, this doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. I've got to know where the other data is. And how we make this work is that um, for every sort of miner in the network, they will always get one challenge uh, at every time step. But then if they want to unlock a second challenge, they have to know how to route to where that data is. So a challenge, just to clear it up, is um, you have a piece of data or a byte offset in the network, and you have to go retrieve it, and you have to do some mathematical puzzle on it. Well, if you don't know where the data is, you can't mine efficiently. Huh, that's kind of cool. So now every miner has to know where every other piece of data is. Okay, so now when you're looking for data, you are at most one hop away from someone that has it. This is, <laughs> this is like a, a huge, huge improvement on the situation. In these other Kademlia-based systems, you can be looking for your piece of data for like seven minutes. Here, it would be hard to imagine a situation where we can't get that down above or to, to an upper limit of like 400 milliseconds. Any piece of data in the world, anywhere, in a properly decentralized fashion. Um, another thing that Arweave 2.6 does is it enables dynamic fee markets. So what we mean by this is uh, in Arweave 2.5 and below, uh, there's a, a sort of necessary consensus step once every, say, six months where the miners come together and we say, okay, is it reasonable to have the base storage price be this much? There's other modifiers to the storage price, but we have to set the base. Well, in this system, we can get rid of that because now we can, um, because we know the speed of access to data, uh, we can essentially calculate more accurately the number of replicas of the data set. And by doing that, we can see how many tokens we're emitting for how many replicas we're getting back. And so we can get a base cost from the miners themselves. And if you're a nerd like me, a cool fact about this is it's a oracle-less price discovery mechanism uh, that incentivizes miners to give the lowest possible price. That's kind of cool because if you're a user, this means the miners are uh, fighting each other, basically, to minimize the price that you have to pay. It's uh, what we would call dominant strategy incentive compatible. Okay, so one of the necessary components of this system is a VDF, that is a verifiable delay function. It's basically a way of saying, I don't care how much compute you've got, you can't, you can't create the number that is 100 seconds ahead of this one uh, faster than I can on my smartphone. Everybody is limited to the same speed. 
and even the NSA or whoever it happens to be. It doesn't matter how much computer you've got anywhere in the world. Uh, there are a bunch of these kind of novel systems. A novel sounds kind of cool sometimes. It's like, yeah, hype, new crypto. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> Cryptography is, is something that you want to be, uh, you want to trust the most old and unbroken system that continues to exist. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, the longer it goes on and the higher the incentive has been for someone to break it, then you can kind of say, well, look, this much effort has gone into breaking it and they failed, so it's probably pretty robust. So we were able to uh, construct a novel, or it's, it's not quite novel, but there's, there's some parts of it that don't, um, okay, some parts are novel, some parts are not. <laughs> but a, a, a new construction for a verifiable delay function out of old components and, and highly, highly robust assumptions. Essentially, it's a hash chain that says, look, you can't compute the hash of a hash without computing the hash. I challenge you, go try it. <laughs> it's tough, really tough. Uh, and that is probably uh, safe, not just beyond our current uh, level of uh, compute, computability, but also quantum computers and anything we can currently imagine beyond that. Okay, so we've been thinking about the, the, the protocol and how things are developing in general. And we see that this is essentially the core feature set of the Arweave protocol delivered. It scales. And we don't just mean that in the like, you know, everything in blockchain scales and then doesn't actually scale. No, it, it really scales. <laughs> uh, it actually scales completely arbitrarily. And this is partially thanks to the problem we're trying to solve. It just turns out that if you have permanent information storage, you have to store very little um, extra metadata about a new piece of information that's added to the network. And subsequently, uh, you don't bloat state and you don't have to modify state individually. So you can do things like, and we're gonna hear from Bundler later, I think, you can do things like bundle together pieces of information that would otherwise be uh, negotiated and committed to the chain individually in one go. And it doesn't solve the fundamental blockchain question of double spends at arbitrary scale, but it turns out you don't even need to because the trust is so low. I deposit five bucks with Bundler and then I, I send, I don't know, like a million transactions and, and I don't care if they run off with the five bucks, it doesn't matter. And, and so when you have it like this, uh, you can literally scale to fitting the entire web in a single transaction. So it, it, it really scales. It's, it's probably the, I don't know, interesting question. Is it the most scalable blockchain system? It's certainly one of them. It's one of very few problems where you can actually build a system that scales uh, with current technology that scales fundamentally arbitrarily. It's energy efficient. Uh, this system wastes about 800 SHA-256 hashes per second per node, something along that line. And for context, your, my MacBook over there, I was trying to work this out earlier, does about eight to, eight to 10 million hashes per second. <laughs> and that's not you know, like a serious compute device by any stretch. So it's using almost no energy uh, and it's maximizing the, uh, the mining process to focus on what we actually want, which is useful proof of work, replicate that data set, keep it safe everywhere in the world more decentralized at a technical level. It's economically efficient. And another thing people don't often realize about Arweave is that it's non-value extractive. So when you're a user, you're basically paying the minimum viable cost that we could possibly charge you to use the network. And, and that goes back to what I was saying about the fee market. Now the miners are even competing <laughs> to lower your cost. And, and as token holders, we don't, we don't care about this. We're not extracting value on the individual um, transactions themselves as they go through, it's just that tokens are piling up in the endowment and the supply is shrinking. And everybody's happy, I would say. So we see this as a strong foundation for innovation. This is the kind of system that you can, well, as we'll discuss later, quit your job and build a startup on. It won't change under your feet because it's essentially complete. This is actually quite interesting because in the blockchain space, this is pretty unusual. Really only Bitcoin is complete. Maybe after ETH2, we'll see what's on their roadmap. But it's very, very rare. And we, we've been able to get to this stage because of these, these uh, features and fundamentally, I think, scalability. Like, you could rewind time and you could imagine a different world and you say, well, what would have happened if Ethereum had scaled from day one? Would we still have all of this phonetic uh, developing activity on the core protocol? Because actually, it's, it's quite, <laughs> in a way, it's quite unpleasant. Um, the core 
promise of a protocol rather than a company is we are not going to change from underneath your feet. You can trust to build on us. But last week, when the Ethereum merge went through, $8 billion of GPUs <laughs> were rendered essentially like useless. I mean, you can still use the GPUs for stuff, but they were purchased for mining. And so that promise that the protocol made to those miners that said, look, you can build a business around this, it's essentially broken. Um, and I don't say this to, you know, trash talk Ethereum, I love Ethereum, but I'm just being realistic. This is, we want protocols that are robust uh, and you can, you can bet your life they're going to, well, your livelihood even, you can bet your economic future on the fact they're going to respect your rights. So, the Arweave protocol itself is essentially becoming stable at this point. And, and there's a way of seeing that that's kind of like, oh, that's, that's boring, we want more hype, more changes. It's actually not the way that protocols work. Uh, <laughs> the value of protocols tends to get unlocked after they stop changing. So here's a, an image that Seb helpfully put, <laughs> put together for me last night, uh, showing all of the hard forking changes to the Bitcoin Core protocol over time. You see that basically it all happened at the beginning, and only later was the value unlocked, because that was when people were able to trust that the protocol was stable. I remember in 2013 when I was looking at Bitcoin, we were thinking, yeah, I mean, like, is Satoshi Nakamoto going to come back and change it? Are there really only going to be 21 million Bitcoins? But now you can build a business on Bitcoin. You can say, okay, I can trust this thing is not going to change. And that's where you see the growth. And this is HTTP. So you see version 0.9 uh, started the kind of growth loop. And, and actually, really, you can still use HTTP 0.9. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> 1.0 and 1.1 were better, but they were marginal improvements from the user's point of view. And that fueled the growth cycle of the entire web. Because people could quit their jobs and they could build on this, trusting it wasn't going to change from under them. Imagine Amazon, if Amazon had to trust that uh, HTTP was not just going to turn around tomorrow and change something fundamental about the web that was value extractive to their business. It's kind of what the Ethereum miners were facing. Um, version 2 here, for what it's worth, and version 3, the user won't even know that they're any different. There are no new features. It just goes faster. Uh, so even today, we're essentially using the protocol more or less unchanged from the feature set in 1997. And that has fueled, like, it must be tens of trillions of dollars in industry, I guess. So you see that actually a lot of the time, growth uh, in a protocol's uses, use cases comes after people can trust that it is stable. And that's why one of the reasons we're so excited, because here we've essentially reached that point of stability. So the spec is out today, uh, and thanks to ARIO, it says an Arweave name service name. You can get to it uh, there and read it for yourself. If you're a developer, we'd love to know your feedback. Uh, and there's also a testnet, um, which you can join to help us test it out. We're going to be running a, uh, an incentivized bug bounty program, basically help us find all the problems with this system in the next few weeks. So if you want some free alpha as a hacker, go find all the bugs early, please. <laughs> you'll, get the, you'll get the biggest bounties. All right. Um, where was that water, please? <laughs> this is a lot of talking. Um, okay, so... Social decent. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Fuck it. We'll do it live, as they say. <laughs> All right. So social decentralization. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's the technical layer. That's good news. What about the social layer? Right. Like this. This community is not just the protocol. It's the people around it. Well, some of you in the audience might remember this tagline from two years ago. We encouraged people in the ecosystem when we'd secured capital to back them to quit their jobs and to build on the new web. And turns out they did. <laughs> um, they did in quite extraordinary numbers. So in the Open Web Foundry alone, which is actually not the whole ecosystem by any stretch, uh, but we've backed, I think, 87 different projects at this point. The combined market capital of, uh, of created value in those projects is excess of 500 million, we think, which is a pretty good start for a couple of years. Um, so we figured, well, it's time to double down. Let's make this even bigger and even better. So we're spinning out the Open Web Foundry into its own, uh, essentially, research lab, uh, incubation, and ecosystem support vehicle called Forward Research. 
We're focused on unleashing the potential of the PermaWeb. And I know that sounds like marketing buzzwords, but I, I mean it actually quite technically. <laughs> the potential of the PermaWeb is kind of locked away in some senses because it is a technical protocol. So there's things that that network can do, but you can't, um, as a user, access until someone builds it. Well, that's what we're focused on doing. Let's make sure that we cut down any sort of barriers between the users enjoying the benefits of the protocol um, and, yeah, the, the protocol's actual abilities. So a couple of, um, I guess, test cases of how we've done this in practice before and what we want to double down on and do even more in the future. This is Kive, or this is the dashboard for Kive now. So Kive Network is a verified data stream protocol on Arweave. It got started back in... Well, the real story starts in, I guess, October 2020, when we were thinking, hey, there are all of these like, blockchains that um, <laughs> they don't have incentives to store their own chain. It's a little bit of a weird thing about blockchains is that actually there's no incentive to store them themselves. They may incentivize people to do stuff or to mine on them, but the actual chain is typically unincentivized. Really, Arweave is the only one that does that. Um, so we thought, hey, I wonder whether they want a permanent storage system for their blockchains. And, and this was becoming more important because the sort of radically scalable blockchains in the smart contract world were coming about. And the more transactions you process, <laughs> the more you need to store. And so this goes from like Bitcoin, this is kind of a, yeah, it's a little bit of a problem, it's not great. And Ethereum was like, oh, you know, if you try and run all those archive nodes, it's like eight terabytes at this point. You've got to buy a hard disk from Ethereum Foundation is typically how it works. Um, <laughs> to Solana, that's like, no, we're going to throw out like three terabytes a day. <laughs> That's a real problem. So we, we spoke to the Solana uh, guys and we said, hey, is this something that interests you? And they said, absolutely. So we got together, we worked out a grant, and we built an MVP of the system. And we thought, That's kind of interesting. There's, there's probably product market fit there. Uh, what if we speak to Polkadot? Did the same thing. They loved it. And then we, we started a, a sort of call in the ecosystem for some to, someone to come and fill this grant. One of the, the, the uh, teams that came through they're like, yeah, this is cool, but what if we scale it to everything? Yeah, <laughs> great, let's do it. <laughs> and so a year and a half later, they built this system that's like 10 times cooler than we'd originally imagined. It's not just one centralized machine that's copying data from one chain to another. It's that they have verify or verification networks for any type of data set. Yes, it's blockchains right now, and they're pushing literally millions of pieces of data to our weave every day. Um, but in the future, it could be literally anything from the centralized web, or I guess the internet. So again, through, through this sort of small helping hand of incubation, of, of getting the founders on board, well, finding the founders, and then helping them um, make the connections that they needed to do the business development work to, to get the support of all the other blockchains, uh, we were able to, to make something pretty, or start the fire, really, of something that turned out to be pretty amazing. Uh, we had a, a, a similar sort of a, um, process, I guess, with Redstone, or at the time it was called <laughs> Limestone, where we, we met Kuba, and, and Kuba came through Open Web Foundry v2. And, and we loved what he was building, and, and we helped you know, with a tiny amount of capital and some introductions to investors. And Kuba and the rest of the team, they raised the round. And that was great. They were building Redstone, which is a, a sort of Oracle service using data stored on Arweave. And I think. If I'm not wrong, they're in the hundreds of millions of pieces of individual data. Yeah, I'm getting a nod. Hundreds of millions of people, pieces of individual data stored on the system as a result of that. But then Cooper and I had this conversation about a year ago. I think, you guys are getting into SmartWeave development. That's pretty interesting. At this point, SmartWeave was, it was like a kind of minimum viable concept, essentially, or a product, really, but concept. Um, and we said, well, what if you guys kind of took it over? And so we helped a little bit get started, and we, we helped connect with the investors, and now suddenly there's a reliable and robust and, and scalable smart contract system built directly into Arweave. So Arweave could, to some extent, already do these things, but we needed to uh, light the fuse again uh, on the, on the yeah, be the spark that led to the unlocking of all of that latent potential in the network. Again, ARIO. So the, the R Drive team, I'm not sure if many of you were there, but <laughs> About this time last year, the Arweave gateway servers were being pummeled by NFT apes who were very, very, very excited to see their gorillas. 
and as a consequence, the, the uh, gateway infrastructure was being stretched for the first time. So there was a problem. So we thought, hey, let's speak to an ecosystem team who might be interested in solving it. We spoke to our drive. It ended up being what they called ARIO, which is a decentralized and incentivized gateway network that now has a ton of capital behind it um, to make this, this system a reality. And it, and it solves a fundamental problem uh, for the Arweave ecosystem. And I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have chosen the phrasing, makes the data storage more usable. <laughs> but there is some interesting truth to that, which is that the protocol itself uh, is there to speak to developers, right? So to unlock the value, you have to build that last mile um, user interface or, or ad additional infrastructure in the, in the intervening zones uh, to, to let the users experience the utility of the protocol. So that's what we're focused on with the uh, forward research group. Uh, we, we looked at the, the funding cycles and the likes for the Open Web Foundry, and we thought, okay, that's pretty good, but what if we made it so anyone can quit their job at any time and come along and just get started right away today and build in the ecosystem? There's no need to have programs. We just have rolling uh, entrepreneur in residence uh, style uh, operations. So anyone that's, that's a good would-be founder can come to the ecosystem and get building, get support, uh, yeah, and, and build the stuff that will unlock the potential of the permaweb. So another thing that we saw with the Open Web Foundry program people liked was the knowledge sharing events. Typically every week we would get together and we would talk about you know, something interesting that someone's building on. Well, we just want to run those all of the time now, not in program, but any time anyone has something interesting to say. We want to get together in cyberspace and discuss it because we see that when people can talk to each other, when they can, uh, they can basically swap the fragments of knowledge that they have, they can combine them to, to unlock new things that can be built on top of the network. So the current priority that we see here uh, is upload incentives. We see <laughs> that we have, um, we built this sort of base storage layer of Arweave, and it's well incentivized, robustly incentivized even, uh, to replicate your data permanently. Great, but now, what if we could incentivize people to upload data in the first place? It sounds kind of like magic, but we think that actually the NFT boom of last year showed us that there's definitely a possibility here. What that showed us was that digital data, one way or another, has some uh, built-in value. So, and interestingly, the more useful it is to other people, the higher that value is, which is kind of cool. So, if we can unlock that value somehow, we can, um, yeah, we can <laughs> flip the model from you pay to store data on our weave to you get paid to store data on our weave. And this will grow usage of the network exponentially, we think. So uh, there are two entrepreneurs in residence working with us already that are uh, looking at this, um, at this model. How can they do it? And one of those is Alex. So they're building a system that incentivizes people to uh, participate or to fund, essentially, archiving pools. So when important things are happening in the world, you can contribute to a pool, and then uh, when data is stored as a result of that pool, and these sort of automated archivers, typically, uh, then you get to be the sponsor of it. it, it yeah, it's, it's a system that lets you essentially associate yourself with a piece of important history. So it's a test case right now, but we think that there's, there might be uh, a lot of legs there to make this one of the routes that we bring, bring in all of the important data from the outside world. We turn it from someone's got to subsidize that to someone actually unlocks value uh, inside that data that they're storing for you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. Another uh, concept that we're looking at in this area is called stamps. So stamps protocol is essentially a universal liking protocol for the permaweb. You can implement it in any application uh, and any time that someone likes a piece of content, and if they're verified, then they get uh, some stamp coins. And these are issued uh, proportionately to ownership of the asset in the first place. So now you're incentivized to upload content that other people like. There's a lot of, to do, but these are, you see, two kind of avenues we're looking at for how can we incentivize people to bring in data to grow the network. But at Forward Research and in the, in the core team, we're not alone. There's actually a really large ecosystem of projects now and, and companies and, and vehicles that one way or another are pushing the adoption of the PermaWeb. 
So this started about a year ago uh, with the, the birth of Permanent Ventures, which is about a I think, $22, $23 million venture fund purely focused on backing founders building on the RWEV ecosystem. But then there was Hansa, which is a product studio based in Australia. I think they have about 12 million on the balance sheet just to build on the Arweave network and again, unlock that nascent value. And then there's Community Labs. I'm sure we'll be talking to Tate in a moment. Uh, they recently raised $30 million to build a product studio unlocking the value of the PermaWeb. This was quite the story. <laughs> But today, we'd like to launch another um, initiative in this area. We're calling it the Digital History Association. It's a Swiss nonprofit foundation focused on maintaining and nurturing the Arweave uh, code infrastructure over time. We want to set the, the network up for long-term success uh, by enabling people in the ecosystem to develop on the core protocol. So we see a lot of other uh, would you say foundations in the crypto ecosystem? They have a, um, an accidental leading effect on the protocols themselves. We don't want to do this. We want the protocol to stand for itself, but we want to be there to protect it if it ever needs help and to, and to make it more robust and to strengthen it over time. So we see our role as not defining where the protocol goes, but proposing ideas. And we want to because of the stage of stability of the protocol, we really want to red team it. We actually want to fund research that says, hey, where is this wrong? Like, is there any possible way that this can go wrong in some sort of form that we don't know about yet? Like, we've seen all too recently, uh, or too much recently, uh, crypto protocols where there wasn't enough due diligence. So we want to red team our own creation and find any weaknesses and solve them long before it's a problem. We want to give grants for security audits, as we are doing, I think it'll be 200, 200K USD for finding uh, bugs in the 2.6 uh, proposed upgrade that we have. And finally, we don't want to be just the only organization building the Arweave core protocol itself. We want to empower people in the ecosystem to build along with us and potentially even build their own implementations of the core protocol. So we're doing so via a grants program. So there's now this sort of decentralized ecosystem of projects surrounding the R uh, protocol, supporting its success over the long term. Uh, yeah, and that's something we're super excited about. We've moved from this uh, early stage where it was really just one group to now, well, I guess here we all are, right? <laughs> um, so thank you all for your time and attention. Um, yeah, this is R 2.6, Forward Research and Digital History Association. <laughs>